I'm Elizabeth Slattery, and welcome to SCOTUS 101, where we break down what's happening at the Supreme Court, what the justices are up to, and other things related to our favorite branch of government. This week, the Supreme Court heard oral argument in four cases and issued a pretty short orders list with no new grants. We'll do a recap of the arguments in our episode next week. But this week, I have a special guest in the studio. Stay tuned. Edith Jones is a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Judge Jones, welcome to SCOTUS 101. Thank you very much. So before your appointment to the Fifth Circuit, you worked in private practice at a firm in Houston, Texas, where you became the first female law partner there. Tell me about that experience and what it was like being the first female partner there. Before I talk about being the first female law partner, we have to look at the seven years that preceded that when I was an associate at the firm. The firm had hired three women the year I started. Eventually, one of them, actually one of them left within one year, and the other one left after about five years, both for personal reasons. Uh, But I stayed. Uh, I was privileged to work with a fellow who was then nationally known in litigation of a very sophisticated sort. Unfortunately, he and his wife were killed in an automobile accident about a year after I started. And from that point, I became a free agent, if you will, working in a variety of litigation, which ended up greatly to my advantage once I went on the bench. I handled cases in antitrust, in workers' comp, in uh, oil and gas uh, disputes, and eventually I was pushed into bankruptcy law because the firm needed a lawyer in that area. I, when I became partner, 1982, I was out on maternity leave with our second child, and uh, everyone treated me very well. The firm was uh, had a lot of gentlemen, but once I was the only lady attending the partners' luncheons, they they were occasionally a bit raucous, <laughs> but we all took that in good stead. That's wonderful. So. Uh, You were appointed to the Fifth Circuit by President Reagan, and you've served there for 34 years now. So tell me, what have been some of the highlights of your time on the bench? To answer this question, I actually had to prepare some notes. I have a drawer behind my desk that is filled with the opinions that I'm proud of, and ultimately it is the quality and the ideas conveyed in those opinions that are going to be my legacy, but... On the bench, I have had the great privilege uh, to have wonderful friends and colleagues. Uh, I've been personal friends with Justices Scalia and Thomas. Uh, Some of my colleagues have been the best friends one could ever have. Uh, I've had over 100 law clerks. I have been very pleased to help train them and to follow their careers, their families, their successes, and many of their challenges. I recently swore in a former law clerk uh, as a judge on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, Bridget Beatty. That was an honor and a privilege to me. Um, I have other law clerks who have served in the White House, the Department of Justice, and the Supreme Court. I even have adopted clerks who originally worked for other judges, and we've become good friends. (laughs) And then finally, I'd mention a two-year service on the National Bankruptcy Review Commission, which generated a report from which I dissented, uh, but resulted in uh, the the opinions of the dissent becoming law about seven years later. So I've read that you traveled to Iraq in March 2010 as part of a State Department delegation. So tell me about that trip. I was... um, Fortunate to be invited to participate in a rule of law program. I wasn't really part of a delegation. I was the only judge. And in fact, I believe I'm the highest ranking U.S. judge to have visited Iraq. Uh, It was during a period when they had just gone through an election. My hostess was a lady from the Department of Justice who had been detailed over there and People do not realize that the United States government had hundreds and hundreds of attorneys in Iraq assisting their judicial system 
in many areas. Uh, one, one of the most significant was training the criminal justice system to rely on evidence and not what you might call uh, confessions in order to make cases and in how to handle terrorist prosecutions. I met with all the top judges in Iraq and in Kurdistan. It was a, it was a uh, brief but very meaningful experience. So as you mentioned earlier, you served as a member of the National Bankruptcy Review Commission, where I understand you had a run-in with Elizabeth Warren, who was an advisor to the commission at that time. Care to share that story? There are too many stories to recount. Uh, (laughs) Professor Warren had been named the reporter for a nine-member commission. A presidential commission, I quickly learned, is a political setup. Four members were appointed by President Clinton. No, three members by President Clinton, four members by the heads of the majority and minority parties in Congress, and two by Chief Justice Rehnquist. We served for two years. We went all around the country holding hearings and discussing the needs of uh, the bankruptcy law and practice at that time. There were considerable abuses occurring in uh, uh, consumer bankruptcy law. There was a need to reform the law to assist small businesses in reorganizing. I can sum it up by saying that uh, Professor Warren and I disagreed in just about everything. (laughs) And I ended up having to write personally 250 pages of dissent from the commission five-member majority report within one week. And the other three members of the minority each wrote additional dissents. But as I say, Congress eventually adopted many of our dissenting positions. Wow. So 250 pages of dissent in one week. That's incredible. Well, shifting gears a bit, uh, you've been involved with the Boy Scouts of America and the White House Fellows Program. So tell me um, how you got involved in these groups and why. I was um, suggested for membership on the board of the Sam Houston Area Council of the Boy Scouts in the early 90s by a colleague on the district court, Judge David Hitner, who has been an active scouter for his entire life, which is now spanning 80 years. Um, I attended the uh, regular board meetings of the scouts. I participated in a membership enhancement campaign, and I supported the scouting program uh, throughout that period. I resigned just a few years ago in order to give someone else an opportunity to participate. The White House Fellows uh, came out of the blue as a, uh, an appointment by um, President Bush after uh, Judge Harvey Brown on the Fourth Circuit had served his term on the uh, commission. And that was a great privilege. The White House Fellows Commission was organized to give uh, talented young people with a record of achievement and a desire for public service, an opportunity to do one-year stints at the highest reaches of the federal government. I was on the National Commission, which means that once a year we would gather in Annapolis for a weekend and interview 30 candidates, uh, again, with the very highest imaginable educational and uh, uh, personal credentials, and then we would select anywhere from around 12 to 15 of them for that purpose. The commissioners were all very distinguished people from every range of every uh, corner of society. Uh, it was a truly uplifting experience. That's wonderful. So I've spoken with a lot of former law clerks about their experiences, but I'd love to hear from from a judge's perspective, what lessons do you hope that your clerks will take away from their time with you? The first thing I try to teach them is to proofread. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever you write anything in for, for legal use, for official legal use, 
it is very important that it turn out looking like a respectable product in the English language with proper grammar and punctuation and so on. Um, if you can't do that, you can't communicate well as a lawyer. I also try to impart by example the value of preparation and particularly the importance of hard work. Uh, I come from a family where both of my parents hardly ever saw the sunrise because they would get up early and uh, they would go to bed late having worked long hours. And I guess I inherited that propensity. Uh, not everybody should be a workaholic, and I am not. But it is only by devotion to your profession in a serious way that you're going to progress. And I'm very proud to say that just about all of my law clerks have uh, learned that lesson. So is there anything you particularly like to do with your clerks, any sort of outings or traditions? I've heard about uh, Judge Timkovich likes to take his clerks skiing, uh, Judge Newsom plays ping pong in his chambers, anything like that? Well, it's hard to find a ski lift in Houston, Texas. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and nobody's ever asked me to play ping pong, although I used to do it. Um, mainly what I try to do is show the clerk's hospitality. So I invite them over to my house, and when they have small children, they, they, they're free to bring the small children over to our house. Uh, my husband and I live in a multi-generational house with three little granddaughters, now aged 10, 5, and 2, and some of our law clerks have children of comparable age, so they can all play together. At Christmas every year, I have hosted a party for all of the Fifth Circuit personnel in Houston. Uh, and since there are now, I believe, six Fifth Circuit judges sitting in Houston together with their assistants and law clerks and their spouses and girlfriends and so on, uh, I, that's a fairly large number. But I also invite all of my former clerks from around the Houston area and their families and such other hangers-on clerks as may show up at that time. Uh, that party now attracts upwards of about 75 people a year. Oh, that's wonderful. One former clerk mentioned that you like to make aspic. <laughs> so that's not something you find on many menus these days, at least in the United States. So how did you get into making these and what's your favorite kind to make? One year, I had a set of law clerks, a couple of whom considered themselves devotees of fine food. And I've been very interested in the culinary arts since I was young because my mother taught me to cook. Uh, my husband and I used to watch Julia Child on TV many, many years ago. In the 1950s and 60s, aspic or molded uh, desserts and molded salads were quite popular, and there were several recipes that I did, uh, including one for tomato aspic, which I believe I served my law clerks. Well, after I'd been lecturing them about aspic, they showed up at the office one lunch period, and each of them brought his or her own aspic, ranging from a chicken in homemade chicken aspic, which is a very fancy French dish, to a uh, some kind of molded fruit salad and some other kind of aspic that I don't recall being very palatable. But <laughs> that was our experience with aspic. <laughs> That's wonderful. If you, if you hadn't gone to law school and become a lawyer, what do you think you'd be doing today? When I was in college, I had the great privilege to observe Alan Bloom teach a course on Plato's Republic. And I was became very, very interested in political philosophy. Had Cornell remained a stable institution, I might well have ended up in an area related to that. However, Cornell nearly fell apart after the uh, spring of 1969 and Alan Bloom and a number of nationally known political scientists and historians uh, left the university. So I was at sea. 
I decided to major instead in economics. I did sort of fall into law school uh, when in senior year I decided I had to think of something to do, so I took the LSAT. Um, the, the profession that I might most have enjoyed was medicine. My father was a, a well-known and really beloved uh, practitioner of internal medicine in San Antonio, Texas, who also had an interest in the scientific and investigative aspects of the practice. My mother had trained as a nurse, had a master's degree in nursing, and after she reared five children, she went back into nursing as a career. Uh, I would have loved the medical profession, but I would have preferred medical school. But at that time, in order to practice medicine, I felt the sacrifices would be too great in order to have a family at the same time. So you took the, the easy path the easy to path. become a lawyer That's and then a right. judge. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, do you have anything in your chambers that reflects your personality or where you come from? I have a lot of things in my chambers. Uh, um, I have a, a set of bobbleheads, uh, one of which is me that my <laughs> law clerks gave me. Uh, there is a picture of the court on banc that uh, some clerks commissioned when we had an on banc uh, hearing. And surprise, surprise, guess whose head stands out the most in this, this courtroom sketch? I have a bald eagle. Uh, no, sorry, a golden eagle uh, that is a, owned by the, the uh, Customs Service. It was confiscated, and it was in another judge's chambers before mine. So it's a, uh, an interior designer would go nuts uh, <laughs> over this panoply, this, uh, ascent, what do you call it, cacophony away of uh, mementos, but they all reflect uh, who I am. Oh, one, one that I'm very proud of actually is a watercolor called Fourth of July in Rockport, Maine, that we bought on one of our annual trips to Maine. That's wonderful. And, uh, Quite a collection of, of eagles. That's great. <laughs> so one final question, something I ask all guests at SCOTUS 101. If you could have a conversation with any Supreme Court justice, who would you pick and what would you talk about? I suppose it would be Justice Rehnquist, uh, for whom I have the greatest admiration. Uh, Rehnquist had the privilege of clerking for Justice Jackson, who was famous as one of the court's greatest writers. He clerked during a very momentous term uh, in the Supreme Court when right at the time that uh, the steel seizure case was issued and uh, Brown v. Board was being discussed or decided. Then uh, he had a political career. He had a career as assistant U.S. Uh, as a U.S. attorney, career in the Justice Department, and then he became a solo voice, almost a voice in the wilderness on the Supreme Court for a number of years, advocating judicial restraint and the virtues of federalism. I am told that he was a very shy man. I would hope that uh, in a candid conversation he would explain uh, how he had the fortitude to uh, hold firm to his ideals in the face of consistent disagreement, opposition, and even caricature. A voice in the wilderness. That's a great way to, to characterize uh, so much of his time on the Supreme Court. Well, Judge Jones, thank you so much for joining me. All right. Thank you. Thanks for listening to SCOTUS 101. Be sure to subscribe on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please leave us a five-star rating. Please follow us on Twitter at SCOTUS 101. You can email us at scotus101 at heritage.org with questions, comments, or ideas for future episodes. You've been listening to SCOTUS 101, brought to you by more than half a million members of the Heritage Foundation. Executive produced by Elizabeth Slattery. Sound designed by Lauren Evans, Thalia Rampersad, and Mark Guiney. For more information, visit heritage.org.